Everybody, I hope you are doing well. We are going to tune into the debate that I had contra Matt Dillahunty uh, on a show titled The End Boss. Uh, now, we debated on whether or not the bodily ascension of our Lord is a reasonable belief to hold. And by the way, the reason I'm adding an intro and an outro is because Matt asked me to do it in order for YouTube to not hit him with a notification of a kind of a, a copyright, uh, you know, violation. Uh, either which way, of course, being one of the debaters, I have permission to post this debate. Although out of respect for Matt, it'll be posted a few weeks after it aired. So it will not be posted publicly until a few weeks after it airs. Now, what we are going to look at we will post a debate in the entirety without any edits at all. But before that, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that I'm going to bring up during the debate that you're going to be privy to, that you're going to be able to see, and you're going to be able to witness firsthand how belief in the bodily ascension is reasonable. Now, why did I choose to debate this particular topic? I was very clear from the beginning that I've debated the bodily resurrection a lot, and I love debating it. I'm still going to debate it every year. But I've never heard a defense of the bodily ascension, and I've heard even theists argue that it cannot be defended, that it's there's too little information to launch a defense of it. Thus, you don't really encounter debates on the bodily ascension. But diving into the way the early fathers taught it, believed in it, and defended it, I think it's worthy to defend. And in fact, I think it's as worthy to defend as the bodily resurrection of our Lord. And do I think we have as much evidence? I think we have incredible evidence, multiple streams of witnesses in the biblical text, and then those outside of the biblical text that serve as a witness to sacred tradition handed down. So I think it's definitely reasonable to believe in. And with that being said, I think you're going to enjoy the debate. Now, after the, the debate, we will review a little bit of the comments from the audience. By and large, the audience were, were, were not pleased by Matt Dillahunty's performance. And I will review many of the comments. Now, does that mean that the atheists all of a sudden are now believers and they've left atheism? I don't think, uh, well, the majority that I read don't indicate that. God willing, I got the gears spinning in the heads of hopefully a few of them. I think last I looked, the video is at close to 30,000 views and not even not even 24 hours, which I am incredibly blessed to see because they will see, in my opinion, a robust case presented for the bodily ascension, not because there's anything special about me, but because I put forth what is taught in Holy Writ and what the early church fathers clearly laid out and clearly taught. That is why I think it is a robust case. Not because there's anything special about William Albright, but because we've got the word of God and never ever fear to defend that word of God. Never be ashamed of defending the Lord. Never be ashamed of the gospel of our Lord. And now we're going to go ahead and check out the video. We're going to check it out and we're going to be able to dive in to the debate. But before we do that, I'm going to show you a little bit of the Old Testament and New Testament basis for the belief in the bodily ascension. After I do that, we're going to dive in to the debate over an hour long. And I want to be very clear for people that afterwards said, well, William, you know, you, know, you didn't get a whole lot of pushback. I think wholeheartedly that is because atheism does not know what to do with the Christological aspects of the bodily ascension of our Lord. That is why I truly whole, wholeheartedly believe. But now we're going to dive in. Get ready. So much of what we're going to look at here uh, is part of my opening statement that you're going to get the chance to hear in a moment when we check out the debate. If you have not watched the debate yet, make sure you check it out here on my channel. And if you've got early access to it, that means you are a patron. And I incredibly, incredibly am grateful for your great support. I appreciate it. 
I am just so thankful that you are able to support us. Your support allows us to have debates like this and allows us to do our firsthand scholarly research. But you're going to find that a big part of my opening statement relies heavily on the what the Catholic Encyclopedia tells us. And what does it tell us? What do we believe when it comes to the ascension? It is the elevation of Christ into heaven by his own power in the presence of his disciples, the 40th day after his resurrection. It is narrated in Mark 16, Luke 24, and the first chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. Now, this was a controversial thing, which, by the way, you're going to be very excited to know that I have filmed an amazing show on the reliability of longer Mark and on the bodily ascension of our Lord with top scholar Dr. Snap. So if you are a patron, you're going to get access to that before anyone else. So it's just, it, it was something I knew was going to come up in the debate. So I, I kind of want to run it by you, the audience. I knew the longer Indian of Mark would come up, and I knew that uh, Matt Dillahunty would not give me much pushback because liberal scholarship really can't when it comes to longer Indian of Mark. They're going to claim the oldest and best manuscripts don't have longer Indian of Mark. That is the argument that they're going to launch against you. But in reality, that's not a good argument because oldest manuscript does not always equal best. That's something we've got to hammer home. Just because it's an older manuscript does not mean that it's the best. And indeed, does not even mean that it's a reliable witness. The reason being, the reason we've got to point that out is because you clearly have the long ending of Mark attested to in early patristic figures, including figures from the 100s, like St. Justin the Martyr and like St. Irenaeus of Lyon. So the idea that long ending of Mark, that the oldest manuscripts we have that lack it are the best ones, doesn't cut mustard because it's available, can be found in St. Irenaeus, which shows that the long ending of Mark is indeed original to the text and belongs there in the Gospel of St. Mark. So why is it important to establish that? I'm going to tell you why. Because the liberals, the atheists are going to argue, you only have one witness to the ascension, thus it's a very poor one. They're going to reject anything from St. Paul, which as we as we lay out in the debate, we don't want to ruin it for you. We show that St. Paul, even St. Paul shows belief in the bodily ascension. But they're going to try and make it seem like only the Gospel of St. Luke and only the Acts of the Apostles, which is the same author, uh, attest to the bodily ascension. So you've got a problem, they're going to say. But if you can establish that it's also there in longer mark, which it is, and which you should be able to do, well, you will discombobulate them. They're not going to know what to do with that. Thus, you need to be able to defend the historicity of the text. You need to be able to defend the Bible. <laughs> really simple. You need to be able to defend the Bible. I mean, that's very, very clear. But uh, we're going to look at two of the passages in the New Testament, and then we're going to begin the debate. You're going to check the debate out. Hopefully, you'll be edified. After the debate is over, remember, we're posting the debate unedited. When the debate does end, then we will be able to dive right in to my post-debate thoughts, including looking at some of the comments that were posted, post-debate ascension thoughts, my review, if you will. So that is something that you're going to want to stay tuned for. You're going to want to check it out. But we would begin with Luke chapter 24, and we think it is very relevant and very important to dive in right there at the Gospel of St. Luke, because in the Gospel of St. Luke, we read that he led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and carried up, was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They were continually in the temple blessing God. What is the issue with Luke 24? The issue with Luke 24 is not much other than the fact that it's a condensed account. You don't have the 40 days laid out, but there's nothing wrong with that. Luke and many other authors condense a lot of things for either clarity's sake or, hey, maybe Luke didn't know yet. He was a historian surveying the landscape. Maybe he didn't learn until his account in Acts. There's nothing wrong as a believer that believes scripture is inerrant. There's nothing wrong with saying that. It's possible that by the time he wrote this in Acts 1, he's finally aware that 40 days had passed, and then our Lord was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. But here's the important thing. Over and over, the theology laid out in scripture 
included in the book of the, the, the Psalms and later applied to our Lord by the uh, St. Paul, <clears throat> clearly shows us that our Lord ascended by his own power into heaven. Now, how is this different from the bodily translations of Enoch and Elijah? Well, in the debate, I lay that out, so you're going to have to stick around to hear that. But in order to prove that the bodily ascension of our Lord is a reasonable thing to believe in, you've got to lay it down from the Old Testament, how Yahweh, Almighty God, rides the clouds. You need to lay out the theology of Christ as the Son of Man, and then you've got to show a robust case from the early church fathers. And I think that we were able to do that. I'm happy that we were able to do that. And I think that you're going to be greatly edified by the debate. But hey, you let me know what you think of the debate. Let me know down below. Let me know in the comments. Were you edified? Do you think the debate was good? Do you want us to participate in more debates of this kind with opponents of the caliber of Matt Dillahunty? God bless you. God keep you. I hope you enjoy the debate.
everybody, and welcome to End Boss. Uh, this show started because too many of my debate opponents focused on beating me, the person, and addressing me, the person, instead of addressing the topic that we uh, had agreed to debate. And I'm just like, uh, they're treating me like I'm the end boss in a video game. So doggone it, I'm just going to embrace it. Now, uh, this is how the the debate format started here, but I will not always be the end boss. You can become a challenger, and when you do so, you can choose, to some extent, uh, who you'd like to go up against. So not every episode of the end boss is going to feature me as the end boss. Uh, here's some quick notes in this early five-minute introduction section on the format, the topic, and our challenger for this evening. So the times for each section are, are rigid, but we may pad them as needed if there are technical issues or things regarding to clear or related to clarification. We are targeting a one hour total time. We will probably run a little bit over, but the hope is to avoid three hours of talking past each other and getting absolutely nowhere. Uh, the format is this introduction. And as soon as I'm done, uh, our challenger will get a 10 minute period where they get to present their case for the topic. Tonight's topic is the bodily ascension of Jesus to heaven. And after their 10 minute presentation, there will be a five minute period where the end boss and the challenger work to make sure that we're in agreement on what a steel man presentation or a steel man statement of the position is. Then there'll be 20 minutes of audience questions uh, directed both through calls and um, through super chats. That means that you need to start getting your questions submitted early because 15 minutes from now is when we're going to start processing them and there will only be 20 minutes of question. There's no guarantee that your question will get used. The inbox is gonna basically curate the questions there, get them popped up and run through. We don't know how long it's gonna to take to answer each one of them. Once that question period's over, there'll be a 10 minute period of direct questioning by the end boss. The challenger will basically address any questions and last minute concerns that the end boss wants to present. And then the challenger will get a five minute period for a closing remark, and that will end the entirety of the debate portion of the show. There'll be some cleanup and announcements at the end that don't have anything to do with the topic, things about, you know, hey, when is the next episode gonna be, and who's it gonna be, and what's the topic gonna be? Tonight's topic is, did Jesus bodily ascend to heaven? And the challenger this evening is William Albrecht, He's a Catholic Christian who holds a bachelor's in theology. He's an international speaker and debater, has participated in several live and moderated, moderated debates, including debating me previously. William is the author of multiple books on Christology, Mariology, and Canon studies. William frequently appears on the worldwide Catholic Global Network, EWTN, Virgin's most powerful radio and relevant radio. Please join me in welcoming for the 10-minute opening presentation, William Albrecht. You seem to be muted. My bad. Uh, should I begin now, Matt? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so my goal is to show you, the audience, the reasonableness of the bodily ascension of Christ into heaven. So what do we mean by the ascension of Christ? Well, the New Advent, which is a Catholic encyclopedia, describes the ascension as the elevation of Christ into heaven by his own power in the presence of his disciples, the 40th day after his resurrection, as it is narrated and laid out, we realize in portion in different gospels, in the gospel of St. Mark, chapter 16, 19, the gospel of Luke, 24, 51, and in the first chapter of Acts of the Apostles, which are clearer than other areas, where other areas may allude to it or have prophecies of it. Not only is the fact of the ascension related in the passages of scripture, which we just cited, but it is predicted and spoken of in various areas. The observance of this feast is one that can be dated to at least the second century, probably perhaps before that, as St. Augustine attests to the fact that this was of apostolic origin. Now we're talking about the celebration of the Feast of the Ascension, noting how it indeed is very important. So that is why it's my goal to show you that belief in the Ascension is indeed reasonable. And I greatly appreciate how Matt has framed putting the burden of proof on me to show you that I must show that it is reasonable. I appreciate that. The catechism tells you that when Christ, after speaking to his disciples, was taken up to heaven, he sat at the right hand of God in his, in his bodily and glorified body post-resurrection. The final apparition ends with the irreversible entry into, of his humanity into divine glory, symbolized by the cloud and by heaven. 
where he is seated from that time forward at God's right hand. In Luke 24, 50 to 51, we read, Then he led them as far as Bethany and lifted up his hands and he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. After that, they worshiped him. The other account that we have in the book of Acts is the ascension account, which is fleshed out more by the same author of Acts, Luke Acts, very, very frequently in the early church. In early manuscripts, Luke and Acts were rolled up together. Acts tells us, you will receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going up and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand up looking toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Why do I call this reasonable? I believe that the early Jews, I believe the whole act needed to happen in the way it did, the bodily ascension in that manner in order for them to be able to comprehend their Lord and Savior, truly uh, he rose from the dead and ascending as the Old Testament clearly foresaw, for, foreshadowed and prophesied that the Messiah would do. And as you know very well, the audience said, understand the books, book of Psalms and various other books. One very key theme they say that many people may be aware of it because it gets found even in pagan literature is the idea of deity ascending, riding the clouds, if you will. Now, we find this at the earliest, earliest periods within the Old Testament texts. You've got it in the book of Psalm 68, which reads, this is a mountain which God desires to dwell in. Yes, the Lord will dwell in it forever. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. <clears throat> you have ascended on high. Now, this would later on be appropriated into a New Testament text quoted verbatim by St. Paul in the letter to the Ephesians. Now, if there's any question on the authenticity of that, multiple scholars, including Dr. Laraniaga, believe that Ephesians definitely is Pauline. But you can find it even in the book of Romans and other areas as well, where Paul clearly believes that Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Indeed, part of the gospel message of 1 Corinthians 15, and I'm not aware of anybody that challenges whether or not that was truly indeed Pauline. But why would this even need to be done? Because to me, it seems like why the need to bodily ascend? Is heaven really even located up there? Well, that's not the message of the Gospels. And that wasn't the message the early authors and the early fathers taught. Rather, they believed that it, it had to be done in that way in order to truly fulfill the prophecies of the Son of Man ascending in the exact same way as the heavenly food descended which is laid out in the book of Baruch and in the book of Daniel chapter 7. So multiple Old Testament prophecies show us that our Lord, the Son of Man, the Messiah, Yahweh, rides the clouds. Indeed, only God has the power to ride the clouds. And in Daniel 7, we have an incredible prophecy of the Messiah presented as Almighty God before the Ancient of Days, God the Father. I beheld, Daniel 7 says, in the night visions, and in one, like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and he came to the Ancient of Days, was presented before him, and he gave him power, glory, a kingdom in all peoples, tribes, tongues shall serve him, and his power shall be an everlasting power. Any Jew would have understood the prophecies that Christ was laying out before them, saying this must occur because of this, and then directly quoting over and over, he applies the Daniel passages to himself, Indeed, in the Gospel of St. John, he connects that to the manna coming from heaven, and he says that this needs to happen directly quoting from the book of Baruch, chapter 3, which talks about Almighty God riding the clouds. So this would have been reasonable, even though, yes, we know many Jews did reject Christ. It does seem reasonable that they would have also wondered, why do we have a poverty-stricken poor carpenter before our very eyes telling us that he's almighty God. It must have been difficult for them to wrap their minds around that. But many Jews also realized what he was saying. Despite rejecting him, they understood the claims, the claims that the Messiah would have to ascend and bodily ascend to return to the right hand of the Father, to, the, to, to return, excuse me, to the right hand of glory 
the glory that he possessed with the Father before the foundation of the world. We quoted Psalm 68. There's many other areas, including Psalm 132, which is later quoted and appropriated to our Lord in the book of Acts by St. Peter and multiple early figures, where it reads, Arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. If you look at the particular formulation of the Hebrew and the Greek there, very clearly is referring to a rising and going to the resting place interpreted in the patristic era and even beforehand as relevant to Christ returning to heaven. Now, we briefly talked about Baruch chapter 3 earlier. Baruch 3 is very interesting and important because it there lays out the theology of particular attributes of Yahweh, of God Almighty. Whenever I say Yahweh, I'm just referring to God Almighty. And it talks about God Almighty being in full possession of wisdom. Later on, this exact text was quoted by our Lord in John chapter 3, exact text, where he tells us, I have told you earthly things, you do, do not believe me. How will you believe me if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, the Son of Man who is in heaven. So you've got that there, our Lord literally telling them that this is going to be fulfilled, and it later does get fulfilled. These prophecies are getting fulfilled. Uh, so we have multiple attestations to this. This would have been reasonable for early Jews to have understood and believed in, because the early prophecies spoke of the Messiah returning bodily in heaven. Indeed, you find that theme of the Son of Man all over the place, the Messiah, Yahweh, riding the clouds. We mentioned multiple witnesses, uh, Luke. Mark, now we don't think St. Paul was literally a witness, but we mean textual witness, early textual witness is what, we, is what we mean. Mark being one of them as well, so Mark is an early one. Romans 8, Philippians 2, and despite it being a little bit later, 1 Peter 3. But as my time runs out, I've got about a minute, there are early apostolic writings as well, probably dated around the year, between the year 70 to 150. That note of reliance on traditions that are not found in the Gospels. Indeed, you have Dr. Cook, Dr. McDonald, and multiple scholars noting that this was built into the life of the early followers, that they truly believe this truly happened by eyewitnesses passing this down, because you've got authors like Pope Clement of Rome, Pope St. Clement of Rome, St. Ignatius of Antioch, uh, St. Bishop Polycarp, and multiple others, as Dr. Lofink points out, that are not, they're quoting from texts that are not from the Gospels, not from Paul. They're not biblical texts, and they're showing awareness of these texts. Indeed, some of these scholars say that they had no awareness of the biblical text. They never quoted from Luke Acts or quoted from the Gospel of Mark, yet they show an attestation to this belief very early on. So I truly think that it is reasonable to believe, due to the amount of early witnesses that are, attest to this, the multiple accounts that have been preserved in history, and the fact that the early Jews would have expected this of their dying and rising Messiah, and my time is up. I want to be strict with the time. All right. I think you're on mute. There we go. Uh, yeah. I, I was trying to make sure that I didn't call for anything or what you're saying. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, we now have uh, five minutes to sort out and agree on a statement that attempts to steel man your position. So um, I took notes and I'm gonna present my first attempt at steel manning it. Um, yeah. If we agree there, then we can start moving on to the rest of it. If not, then we'll fine tune this. So here's my attempt to steel man your position. It is reasonable to believe Christ elevated bodily to heaven on his own power because the Old Testament promotes that this is what the Messiah must do. And the New Testament reports that this is what happened and people believed that this is what happened. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, I, I think you laid it out uh, perfectly well. Awesome. If there's anything at all that we need to add. There, there, there might uh, be one, one other nuance. Can I add maybe one other nuance? Oh, one yeah. other nuance that I would add, although I think that you got it you got it perfect. One other nuance that I would add would be that this was uh, particularly something that would have been expected of the divine figure, the son of man, and needed to be done in order to truly prove that he was that figure uh, that he said he was from the Old Testament. That's the only other thing that I would add. Other than that, I think you got everything laid out perfectly. All right.
So let's see. It's reasonable to believe Christ elevated bodily to heaven on his own power because the Old Testament promotes that this is what the Messiah, to confirm he was a divine figure, must do. And the New Testament reports yeah. that this is what happened, and people believed that it happened. Correct. Yes. You laid it out well. All right. So we got a couple of minutes here uh, left in the steel manning portion. Um, I'm not going to break the rules and come in and start jumping in and, and <laughs> getting to questions on my own and stuff. Uh, just as a reminder for everybody who's watching, first of all, thank you everybody for tuning in. We wanted to get started right away. Um, thrilled that we managed to get a good, uh, you know, foundation here and that Williams come in to, to honor this format. Uh, I won't be presenting anything at all during this little steel manning position, uh, or other than to say thank you guys so much. And I will be reviewing uh, Super Chats and incoming calls and directing those to William in the next portion, which is going to take roughly, a tw we'll put a 20 minute clock up there. That time will be questions from the audience, either in Super Chat uh, or in calls. And Matt, can, can, can I ask note, one question? Sure. For the yes. when we get the calls when they come in, I, I don't. I want to be respective of time because I know you'll get probably a good amount of them. Uh, do do we have a limit on how long you want me to answer that? Maybe a minute, thirty seconds, two minutes. Uh, what what? Um... I I decided not to put a strict time limit on anything. Okay. The way the time limits work in this section is that whoever the end boss is is going to control the time. So that if we get a, a challenger who just goes on and on about something that's not answering the question to try to occupy all gotcha. the time which would be a terrible waste. I mean, this is your opportunity to present your case. I wouldn't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, no doubt. Uh, That's why I want to be respective of time. Yeah, I, I think, yeah. well, we'll we'll make, we'll try to make sure that the end boss is, uh, is, is pushing on, on the time correctly. And callers, okay. by the way, if I select your call, uh, the call screener should have already told you, but the calls will just be, uh, hi, my name is, and my question for William is, and then you state the question as succinctly as you can. There will not be follow-up questions. There will not be discussion between the callers and the challenger. Um, so as soon as we're sure that we understand the question, which is something we'll probably do really quickly, uh, then we'll let that caller go. And uh, I'll do something similar with the Super Chats. All right. Are we ready? Madam producer extraordinaire to shift on to the next portion. Yep, trying to get this timer actually on. There you go. Awesome. And here we go. First, we're going to take uh, Richard in Louisiana. Thank you. You're on with William. Hi, uh, my name is Richard, and my question for William is, what is your non-biblical evidence for the resurrection? My non-biblical evidence for the resurrection would be figures that I mentioned towards the end of my opening statement, such as Pope St. Clement of Rome, uh, who, if you want to conservatively date him, we could date him to around 80 to 90, or latest, maybe 120 which is considered an apostolic witness uh, in the terms of he's an apostolic era writer, St. Ignatius of Antioch, Barnabas, and the other one would be Polycarp. And the reason those would be other witnesses that I would bring in is because we've got multiple scholars saying that it seems like when they quote and they talk about the ascension, that apparently they're not quoting from any of the biblical evidence and multiple scholars uh, say that they're quoting from a separate kind of tradition. Thank you, Richard, for that call. Continuing I try to on. be pretty, I try to pack it in there, Matt, and I try to give him a good answer and pack it in. That was pretty good. It didn't go too long. Yep. I'm, I'm, I'm getting notes for potential follow-ups later. Question number two awesome. is, uh, Cl Cloud in North Carolina, you're on with William. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cloud, and I have a question for William. How do you know that heaven exists, and how do you know that Jesus ascended to heaven without using the Bible as proof? Yeah, okay. So that's a great question. So a, a lot of what Catholics believe, uh, Cloud, relies heavily on sacred tradition, which is liturgical texts that have come down to us. So we rely on the Bible as well, but we're not a Bible alone faith. In, in, indeed, the Bible wasn't put together till the late fourth century. A lot of texts that pass down historical information is a lot of what we rely on. So we can look at writings of 
successors to these individuals that said that they were witnesses to them and that claimed that he truly rose from the dead and they passed this along and multiple people attested to this. The other question you asked earlier, I want to be able to touch upon it respectfully. You asked, how do I know heaven exists? Well, of course, I've never been there, but I trust in what the scriptures say and what the church has always taught. But of course, in order for me to believe that heaven exists, Oh, many other things of the faith have got to have been accepted, which I have already accepted beforehand. I don't want to veer too far off the topic of Christ bodily ascending, but those source materials, I think, are very, very important. And they help me truly say, okay, these attestations lend support to the biblical evidence, even if we look at them merely as texts written by fallible men, which they were fallible men. All right. Thank you, Cloud. And the third question coming in from caller is going to be pretty similar to the last two, but uh, just in case it's yeah. slightly different or you have a slightly different answer, I want to make sure we get to that as well. So Tone in Texas, you're on with William. Thank you. Um, hi there. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, that since most of your arguments seem to be based around uh, biblical scripture, um, New and Old Testament um, alike, um, what criteria did you use to rule out um, other uh, religions that completely disagree with that, that might even be older and also contain lots of factual information, like Hinduism and such. That's a great, great question, and I appreciate you asking that. So I, I heavily dug into uh, pagan religions and even those that predated paganism uh, to look and see, okay, is there is there anything that holds up to the claim that this was copycatting? And I, I, I found nothing. I found, without a doubt, within paganism, there are dying excuse me, dying and rising deities, but those texts are very late and they very, they, they very much post-date any of the texts that refer to the Messiah in the Old Testament, the Son of Man, they're much, much later. And if you look at the writing, uh, he's dug into this, he studied it. Dr. Lee McDonald says that early, perhaps the earliest attestation to these rising kind of deities comes within the Egyptian uh, milieu. And he says that there, it really seems to have been very spectral-like and not bodily. So I think, my for my that i've studied this very in depth my studies show me that this is unique in this way to christianity and sure other ascending deities came later at a later time but as justin martyr points out in my in my humble opinion i can't see anything where it seems like this is ripping off rather the pagans stole this from ancient judaism and perhaps even christianity due to the late writings of the texts all right Thank you, Tone. And a quick reminder or a quick note for the callers who've called in. We, we, we limited this to one question per caller, um, and we're trying to make sure we get as many opportunities for people to call in and ask questions. If, in fact, you have a follow-up question that you would like to ask, you are welcome to call back um, and, and try and do that. In the meantime, we've got some questions via Super Chat, and there's a common theme, which um, is, is pretty interesting here. But if we get this super chat up now, this is uh, from Arsenic 1987. For William, it's hard to take this on reason since it's using the Bible as your source. What evidence exists outside of the Bible? I know you've been asked that several times now, but this sure. some of these came in before we addressed any of them. We atheists are listening intently, int intently anything not in the Bible. And if I may, I, I would say that maybe one of the, the best ways to, to address this question has come up a couple different times is... And, and if this is cheating on my part, somebody can chew me out later. Um, when you mention like um, Clement and, and others, you refer to them as witnesses. But I would, I, I would, I would want to know: Are you saying that they witnessed the event, or they are witnesses gotcha. to attestations about the event? Gotcha. I, I, uh, my fault for not being clear enough about that. Thank you for asking for that clarification, Matt. When I bring up figures, and so let me ask that, and let me, let me try to make it clear for arsenic. When I refer to Clement, and I refer to um, Barnabas and these other figures, particularly Clement, that are incredibly early on, indeed, multiple scholars believe Clement finished his letter to Corinth before St. John's Apocalypse was finished. I refer to Clement as a witness to a textual tradition. Uh, written or passed down orally, a tradition that has been passed down. Why do I do that? Because I've read multiple scholars, uh, even scholars that are definitely not conservative, that say that 
And of course, this doesn't prove the ascension, but I think, in my opinion, it lends even more support as we've got multiple witnesses. So Clement and many others are witnesses to textual and uh, sacred tradition passed down to them as some of these figures had no awareness or didn't quote from the Gospel of St. Mark or Luke or the text in Romans, yet they show awareness of this event having occurred. So that to me lends great support to the belief in the ascension. These early figures, I wouldn't go into the second, into the late second century or third or fourth, but I think these apostolic figures are very important. By the way, it's just a side question for me. This isn't going to be hard on anything else. Do you have a date for Baruch? For Baruch? I will pull that up yeah. right now. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't, but I'll pull that up right now. Yeah. yeah. I'll because get this for you right now. From my background, I mean, Baruch isn't canonical. And so I just. Oh, yeah, I got you. Okay. I, I don't have a date for it. So. I'll get that for you before, uh, like, whenever we're done with this, I don't want to rob any time from the audience. Right after this, Absolutely. I'll get you a date right away. $10 from Smart Alec Atheist. William, why does the ascension necessitate a physical body rather than a spiritual body? Great. I would answer and say that it, it, it is both. So if you read 1 Corinthians 15, St. Paul describes the physical body as a spiritual body. So the Bible uses spiritual in the very real tangible uh, sense, but spiritual means glorified holy body. So you, you may mean, why is it not, uh, why is it not kind of symbolic? Uh, because it necessitates that because that's what St. Paul claimed to have physically witnessed. And the eyewitnesses claim to have witnessed him truly bodily rising from the dead. And it seems to me, even though that the bodily aspect uh, and the resurrection aspect aren't present in Daniel 7, where we have that prophecy of the ascension account, what is present there is the vision of a figure that looks like a man, which gives indication of the physical nature of it. So I think that's why the ascension is so important in that particular sense. It fulfills what the people saw him bodily rise. He predicted he would return to the right hand of glory. So if he bodily rose from the dead, he would physically rise to be it, to return to the right hand of the Father in heaven. I think hopefully that answers it okay. And yes, I'm aware that we don't have the clock up in this mode. I've already uh, yeah. let Arden know about that, but we'll be getting time updates and I uh, won't run over. From Painted Drake, thank you, Painted Drake. For William, just because many people believe it happened doesn't does that have any truth to it? My mind goes yeah. to belief in aliens and Bigfoots. I think to, to Steel Man, their question is, uh, there are plenty of claims, Bigfoot, aliens, bodily ascension. What makes this one sure. distinct? Or do you also believe, you know, aliens and Bigfoot and things like that? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't believe in aliens or Bigfoot. Uh, but uh, when it comes to why is this different? I think the the amount of attestation to this early on, the fact that you have enemies of the faith, that to me is the most important thing. Not just attestation, I want to be clear, because believers could very well view something and you can say, well, of course they were believers, they expected that. But what about enemies of the faith, those that clearly didn't follow our Lord, those that abandoned him at the foot of the cross when, when he was being brutally murdered? Uh, they witnessed to this, they recorded this account, and I think their followers recording this account and them going to their martyrdom lends great support to this. So I think all of that combined with the post-biblical evidence, I think it lends support to it being a reasonable belief. Uh, now, of course, uh, I don't have any video evidence or any photography kind of evidence, but I think the text and the witness tradition that we've got, I think it makes it reasonable to believe, including the fact that this would have been expected by the early Jews. And this was the unanimous early interpretation of Daniel 7 by the early Jewish community. They expected this of their Messiah. Daniel 7 was messianic to them. All right. From Mahalia. Sixth Yager. century BC, Matt. I'm sorry about that. Sixth, Sixth century BC for Baruch. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We have lots of evidence that Abraham Lincoln was a real person beyond Abraham Lincoln, vampire hunter. What evidence do you have that Jesus was real beyond the Bible? And I'm going to preface this by saying, uh, technically, uh, mythicism is not the subject of this debate, neither is whether or not the crucifixion represented any sort of sacrifice. But because this is, you're making claims tied to someone that some people don't necessarily believe is real, I wanted to make sure you got a chance to actually answer this if you feel like it. 
Sure. Yeah, no, definitely. Anybody that wants to, to, to give a super chat, uh, appreciate you supporting Matt. He's been charitable enough to host this debate. Uh, yes. Yeah, so what evidence would I put forth that I think Christ was a real figure beyond the Bible? I think I would stick to the enemies of the faith that attest to the fact that this man uh, truly did live and truly did die, was crucified. Now, you're not going to find figures of Lucian of Samosata or Rabbi Akiba, we know Rabbi Akiba, second century, you're not going to find any of these figures saying that they believe he rose from the dead, but even figures like Josephus, a Jewish historian, show awareness that he existed. They believed, of course, that he was a criminal, and he was crucified as a criminal, a war criminal, or whatever kind of criminal you want to call him, uh, but they attest to the fact that he truly did exist, and I think the enemies of the faith lend great support to the belief in the historical Jesus of Nazareth. All right. This is a, a repeat. I just want to make sure it got up so that they can be thanked. Uh, seven lines. The argument presupposes the Bible is a reliable source of information. Why should we believe that? Um, Williams addressed this in a couple different ways, whether or not he had extra biblical sources and why he thinks it's reliable. So I'll, I'll just thank you for your super chat, seven lines, and we'll get on to a couple more. This is uh, from Design Song. JFK was assassinated over 60 years ago. Can everyone now claim to be witnesses to his assassination? And I think this touches on what I was asking about, uh, yeah. for example, Pope Clement. You know, what was he actually witnessing? And so I think yeah. we've addressed that, unless you want to add on to that. I, I, can, touch up, I can touch upon it again, because uh, it's my fault for not having been clearer earlier, Matt. So uh, when I mentioned Pope Clement, figures like Clement of Rome, Barnabas and others, I when I use the term witness, I didn't mean that they physically witnessed him rising from the dead and bodily ascending. My uh, point was that they are a witness to a tradition, a sacred tradition that has been handed down that wasn't confined alone to the biblical texts that we have. I think that's pretty valuable and pretty powerful. In my opinion, if you want to reject the Bible and say it's just a, a, a fictional work, I think these figures show that they have a, they're a witness to a tradition passed down that we can rely upon okay by the way arden's going to cut back to the two up at the two minute mark and we'll take uh another call or two okay. if there's time this one's from andre Cathar catharino sorry if the church chose those 27 books and burnt every other what gives them the authority to choose which books were or were not correct and why don't you trust the church today or do you oh okay yeah, well, I do trust the church, um, and I don't think that they burned any, uh, at least not in the fourth century when they chose which books were going to be canon. Uh, and I think you're referring to the New Testament text. Uh, I, I do trust the church because I'm Catholic, and it was the Catholic church that put the Bible together. So I do trust the church, but I don't think they burned any particular books at that period because books that they rejected, uh, many of them continue to get used in the lectionary, in the liturgy. Even today, some books that are not biblical get quoted from because they're viewed as ecclesiastical, a church useful to use in the church, just not biblical. So I do trust the church that call those books canonical. And I don't think they chose that they sat down and they decided which ones. I think they queried, which Augustine says, they queried the apostolic churches that they all came back with the same New Testament list. I think that's important. Okay. This one, I'm going to add something to here. Uh, Toy Soldier 727 says, you claim it's not a retelling of a story, yet there are six resurrections prior to the Bible. Square the two. Uh, let me just jump in here for a second. Um, I don't know what specifically Toy Soldier is referring to. And even if there were yeah. 5,000 resurrections, that isn't relevant to how many bodily ascensions there were. Um, so yeah. just for clarity, that would direct your focus on answering this. Yeah, no, I definitely uh, correct there, Matt. Uh, and one thing to just uh, add, I think that if you, uh, very strong evidence could be put forth if you could show that this is def directly uh, ripped off, uh, copied from any particular uh, contemporaneous kind of a source, which I've looked and I've done research. Uh, when it comes to, to prior resurrections, uh, I don't know which figures you may be referring to, uh, but even at that, the, the, the argument put forth of the dying and rising excuse me, the dying and rising pagan gods, I, I just don't find anything there. I don't find that to be valid at all. Okay. And $10 from Brianne Daugherty. Are there any discrepancies between the accounts of those who claimed to witness his ascension? We can find, I, I wouldn't call it a discrepancy. I would say that Luke 
originally in Luke 24, I believe, uh, originally is very rushed in his dis description. Could it have been that he simply wasn't aware how long it took for him to ascend? Or could it have been that he was running out of scroll? We really simply don't know. He condenses it massively. He does that for many other things, but he condenses it massively. <clears throat> and then when he returns to it in Acts 1, it's more elaborate. And now we hear of the 40 days. I wouldn't call it a discrepancy because he doesn't say, well, he, he rose, he ascended the same day or in a few hours or 10 days later. But we can definitely find it elaborated upon. But as far as any discrepancies like maybe this contradicts that, there's nothing of the sort in Romans, Ephesians, or any of the gospel accounts, or in the gospel of St. Mark, uh, the longer ending of that. There, there's, it's just really real simple. He, he bodily ascended before their eyes. All right. Uh, we'll go back here, and I've got uh, a call or two. And Richard in Louisiana, you are on with William. Thank you. Hello. My question for uh, William is, what are your thoughts on Matthew 27, 51 through 53, in which the earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. And is it reasonable to believe this as well? Am I allowed to answer that, Matt? Yeah, I will I will say that, um, thank, you, thank you, Richard, for the question. Uh, there are plenty of things, there are plenty of biblical claims that we're not going to be expecting William to necessarily address. You can address this, but yes, uh, if the question basically goes to reasonableness of if you're going to say it's reasonable to believe that Christ ascended bodily to heaven, are there other claims in the Bible that you perhaps don't find reasonable? Do you think the dead rose and, and marched on Jerusalem um, during the crucifixion or not? I think it's fair. You can yes or no yeah. it or avoid it however you like. Yeah, no, I, I do think that in part, in part uh, I know that the Gospel of St. Matthew is the only uh, Gospel account that records that, but we have that recorded in all of the apostolic writers post-biblical era, so I, I do think that that truly did happen. I think that was a valid account, and I, I don't think that was fictional. All right. Thank you, Richard. And the final question, um, which will take us right to the end of the time there, uh, Leon in Iceland has a question for William. Thank you, Leon. Yes, it's uh, Leon. Uh, so I've been wondering why the cross, it is a tool for execution. Uh, well, the one that we don't use anymore, but, and I understand like uh, the crucifix as uh, Jesus is on the cross as a martyr. I understand that, but why just an empty cross? Why carry around a cross? That, that uh, I don't get that. Okay. Uh, well, Catholics and Orthodox Christians wear a cross with Christ on it, crucified. Uh, perhaps other evangelicals are not so uh, open to the idea of, of having icons or, or representations of Christ and wearing them. But I can answer you from the perspective of a Catholic. Uh, we venerate and we revere images and icons. And utilizing the cross with Christ on it reminds us of the great sacrifice that our Lord and Savior did for us. And we pre preach Christ crucified as St. Paul says. So that's the reason why we do it, uh, simply preaching Christ crucified and remembering what he did for us. All right. And that brings us to the end of the 20 minute gauntlet of uh, dealing with the audience. And uh, here we are now, the next segment here is 10 minutes where the challenger faces questions directly from the inbox. What I plan to do is I've, I've jotted down some questions prior to today uh, or prior to the, to the start and uh, some questions that have come up as a result of these things. I'm going to ask these questions, uh, direct the time, see if we can get uh, good answers from Williams over the next 10 minutes. And then when I'm done, William will have another five minute period to summarize and uh, then I'll be back to, to wrap all this up. So if we can start the time there, I'm ready. There was a lot that addressed what evidence you might have beyond the Bible. And we dealt a little bit with witnesses. Um, there was something that, that you, that was not specific enough for me. And that is when you look at what the new Testament says about the Ascension, um, Matthew really doesn't say anything about it. Uh, Mark only mentions it in the disputed verses, um, cause the long ending of Mark, Mark 16, nine through 20 is disputed as reliable. I'm assuming that because you referenced Mark 16, 19, you find that 
reliable and should be considered canon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, I do. Yeah, I do. John doesn't mention it in the timeline of after the resurrection, here's an ascension. But Jesus in two passages, uh, John 3.13 and John 6.62, uh, do, does reference an ascension. No one And in 3.13, he says, no one has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. What about Elijah? Yeah, so you want me to answer all of that? Let me try and, and, and gather all of that. So uh, I think that even if we take the shorter ending of the Gospel of St. Mark, uh, you, of course, you don't have that ascension in the shorter one. I believe the longer one to be the valid one, as quoted by multiple early witnesses, early patristic witnesses, shows that they had the longer ending. But you've got the Son of Man text quoted in, in the chapter before you have the shorter ending that most scholars today hold to. Uh, and I think the Son of Man does appear in the Gospel of St. Matthew as well. So when it comes to Elijah, e Enoch and Elijah, uh, the big difference is that they were bodily translated they were taken up to heaven by god and the text is very clear about that it draws the distinction that only god and yahweh only god can can ascend by his own power but rather enoch and elijah were, were translated by god so i think that that's the difference that i would draw and i would say the bodily ascension of christ is reasonable because of that distinction okay the the problem i have though is that in john three thirteen, jesus mm -hmm. specifically explicitly says no one has ascended up to heaven but he that came down from heaven even the son of man which is in heaven now obviously when he's saying mm -hmm. that he, he's not in heaven apart from in some trinitarian sure. sense but mm -hmm. why would it matter your your claim about elijah that you know if jesus is saying no one's ascended to heaven but he that came down from heaven are you does that mean elijah came down from heaven as well no. So there's a big difference again. We don't believe that Elijah or Enoch ascended. We believe that they were bodily translated. They were taken up to heaven. So the difference in that is, as Baruch and as Christ clearly lay out, is that only God has the power to ascend by his own power. So the reason that he's quoting from Baruch 3, and if you read Baruch 3, it says only God is in full possession of wisdom and has this power so there would be a, a very big distinction between what happens to Enoch and Elijah because God bodily translate them, translates them. They, by their own power, don't go to heaven. So I think that's the, the distinction. Okay. Does that make any sense? I hope it does make sense. I, I, will, I will try to see here. I think I understand what you're saying in that when Jesus okay. says this, when he says ascended, that is specifically ascended on their own power, which is distinct from Elijah yes. being carried up in a chariot of fire. What's that's the correct. justification yes. for that understanding of ascended? Um, Mm -hmm. So it tells us directly, if you look in the in the Old Testament texts of Enoch and Elijah, it tells us that God took them up. And the the justification for that distinction that I'm drawing is that the Son of Man, by his own power, bodily ascends. And John is very clear about that, and where, the Gospel accounts it? are clear. Okay. John says it where? Oh, when John is quoting that, Yahweh is the one that rides the clouds, and that only Yahweh can descend and ascend I think that's very clear because we don't read that the Son of Man, we don't read that Christ is taken up by the Father. We read that he bodily ascends in all of the ascension accounts. But Enoch and Elijah, we don't read that they, by their own power, did that. We read that God took them up because they were justified people. Well, I, don't, I didn't find anything that specifically um, supports the notion of bodily ascension as opposed to a spiritual ascension. Because oh, I see. We, okay. Okay. When, I see. when we read... When we read the New Testament, it just says, you know, John references uh, ascending to heaven. And what if you would see the Son of Man ascending up to where he was before? Uh, everything else, you know, in, in John 20, 17 is I'm not yet ascended. All that talks about ascending. But one of the key issues um, was, and I think somebody asked this, why is bodily ascension the important part as opposed to a just spiritual ascension or... Uh, because there were others in, in this time period. It, it was not, yeah. I wouldn't say it's it was crazy common, but there were attempts by people to say so-and-so ascended to be with God as a way of kind of showing that they got God's approval and were a greater significant person. So is the bodily part important? I think the bodily part is, is important. Now, now, Matt, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I, I don't know, maybe you have studied the issue. I, I know that around the time period, there were stories of, of dying and rising uh, pagan 
uh, emperors, if you will. I don't know if they ascended bodily. I don't, I don't know what the dates were. I know some scholars say they ascended spiritually. I think the distinction would be that, yes, it is important that Christ ascend bodily because all of it is connected to what 1 Corinthians 15 tells us. And the, 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 the resurrection account is a real physical, tangible body. And if you read that whole account towards the end of 1 Corinthians 15, towards the end of the gospel account, he does talk about Christ returning to glory in heaven. So even though he doesn't lay out the ascension, he does have that there. So I think bodily ascension is important, tied to him bodily rising from the dead. So I don't think that any of the ascension accounts, well, they don't distinguish. They don't say, well, it was merely a spirit. I mean, they see him physically ascend. I think that's the most logical thing because he tells them that he's going to leave them in the Gospel of John, but that he won't leave them orphans. He'll leave the Holy Spirit with them. I think it's pretty indicative of him bodily rising, or rising in the sense but, of ascending. But am I correct in that there's not a, a text that we can point to that expressly says it necessarily was bodily ascension, but that you are inferring from the descriptive language that it's bodily ascension? Um, if, I, if you look, I'm trying to see, if you look at Luke 24, I think it's pretty indicative because in Luke 24, 50, you have him lifting up his hands while he's blessing them. He withdraws and is carried up into heaven. All of it is he's there physically. So him being there physically with him present, then lifting up his hands and then rising up. I think it's logically it logically entails from the whole fact that he's with them. He even eats with them. We even read yeah, of a meeting with them. So I think. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I thought there was a gap. You actually went to the next verse that I was actually going to address because Luke 24, 51 ah, gotcha. uh, suggests that as he was blessing them, it says he was parted from them, and it says, mm -hmm. and carried up into heaven. Now, carried yeah. is, is a verb that doesn't suggest that it was ascension on his own merits. It, what if it was the case that God spirited Jesus up to heaven, non-bodily, and not of Jesus' own um, power, but that the gospel writers and, you know, Luke, who wrote Luke and Acts almost certainly, referred to it as ascension. I mean, we're still, we're still looking at it predominantly in English here, and there's going to be limits when you get into Greek and Aramaic. Um, uh -huh. If it says carried, why doesn't it say ascended there in Luke 24, 51? Right. Yeah. So that's a great question. So it, it, St. Paul will use the word ascended in the book of Ephesians. There in Luke, it doesn't. But I think it's logically entails with the fact that before that, earlier in the Gospel of Luke, he talks about, he actually repeats the same prophecy of the Son of Man riding the clouds, returning to heaven that all of the other Gospel writers uh, recount. I think that, coupled with the fact that, that comes to fruition in Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, I think that logically entails, I don't think he has to use, Luke particularly used a, a Greek word for ascended there as he's carried into heaven, but you do have that particular thing. I believe it's laid out very clearly in Acts 1, as you, you admit, it's the very same author. It tells us this Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven, you never have any of the texts say, well, the Father took him up. No, rather you have him talking about the Son of Man needing to go back to the right hand of the Father, and then this does come to be fulfilled in the gospel accounts. You don't ever read of the father being the one taking them up. Yeah, we're, we're running low on time. And, and I was I know, going to make I know. the thing that you've already kind of addressed, which is that Luke, if you read the, 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 the story, it appears as though it happens on resurrection day, whereas the same author writes 40 days later. Um, just as, since you already addressed it, we'll just leave that there. Um, okay. How do you ascend to heaven? Where is heaven? And why would one need to ascend bodily if this is a spiritual realm that doesn't exist in reality? Yeah, I think the reason he bodily ascended before their eyes was to confirm everything else that he had said. I don't think, I think in order for the followers of Christ, their finite, limited minds to understand he was returning to the right hand of the Father, that needed to be accomplished to show them that just as he said in the Gospel of John, just like the manna came down for your fathers in heaven, I am going to return to the Father in that same way. I think him doing that confirms to them that he truly was who he said that he was, and that's why he needed to do that in that particular way. Not that heaven is literally up there in the clouds. I don't think that was the literal message of the text. 
Okay. Well, we've technically run out of time and I'm not going to cheat my last answer or my, my response to that in any way, but I'm sure we'll discuss this at some point. Uh, to finish up this format, first of all, William's going to have five minutes to provide a summary of his position in response to both the questions from you guys and the questions from me so that he can put a bow on it and find out whether or not he's convinced people that Jesus bodily ascended to heaven. So William, the five minutes is now yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for that, Matt. Thank you, uh, everybody's questions. I hope that uh, even people that maybe may not believe in the bodily ascension or may have great doubts about it at least say, okay, well, maybe this is reasonable for an early first century Jew because the clear Jewish text prophesied of this, the earliest, all of the earliest interpretations of Daniel 7, unanimously early Jewish ones, expected their Messiah to ride the clouds, to return to heaven, to be in heaven. Now, I think Matt brought up a number of interesting things uh, in term, and the audience did a great job. I'm just impressed by the fact that so much, much of this audience critically think, why need to do it in this way to begin with? I think the text of the Gospel of St. John is very clear. If the manna that came down from heaven in that way was indicative of their people being fed, and the Son of Man said he would return the very same way that the manna fell down, and he is the new bread of life, the new manna, indeed present in the Eucharist, would ascend in that way before their very eyes to fulfill everything that he had said. I think that was the necessity to do that, and to also show them in their limited, our limited, finite minds, to show them he indeed was going to return to the right hand of the Father in heaven physically. Why does it have to be physical? Because the gospel, excuse me, because uh, the resurrection account in 1 Corinthians 15 is of the physical nature. St. Paul talks about a real tangible body, bodily resurrecting. And this ascension is very important because towards the end of it, he has the ascension account included there. Well, he implies, actually, he doesn't imply, he flat out tells you, Christ has returned to the right hand of the Father in heaven. But why else do I think in my three minutes of time that you, the audience, should give this time and attention? Not much attention has ever been given to the ascension, most of it to the resurrection of Christ. I think we should give this attention as well, because multiple early writers that walked and talked with the apostles, Pope St. Clement of Rome appears in the Bible multiple times. Many of these early figures serve as witnesses to a tradition passed down. And when I talk about witnesses, when I talk about Clement, Barnabas, and these other figures, I mean witnesses to a sacred tradition passed down. Now, I quoted multiple scholars that confirm this, and I think that's important to know. They're not all relying on these texts as witness. So we've got multiple streams of, of, of textual support. The longer I need to mark, which I know older manuscripts do not have, but the early church fathers, anti-Nicene, writing incredibly early, do utilize it, showing that it existed at a very early period. So that's important that we've got the Gospel of Mark, uh, St. Matthew, which talks about the Son of Man, Luke and John, and we've got St. Paul as a very early attestation to this as well. So we have multiple eyewitnesses, St. Mark being one, St. Matthew being another one. Uh, so this is important, St. John another. It's important because the Jews would have expected this. They knew this. This was a very clear and important belief of the Son of Man as laid out in Daniel chapter 7. Our Lord lays it out in John 3, where he quotes directly from the book of Baruch. Uh, I think that's an important one, and it talks about only the Son of Man being truly able to do this, because only the Son of Man is in full possession of wisdom, meaning he's Almighty God. The other important point laid out is when our Lord is physically with him. Over and over in these texts, we read of the ascension account. So he's physically with him, and they see him ascending, all of this is of the physical nature. And of course, the resurrection account is of the physical nature, even though this is not about the resurrection, it's about the reasonableness of the ascension. So to conclude in my final minute, uh, I wanna first off thank Matt, thank everybody for being gracious and for being able to present my case, allowing me to, and I would conclude it by noting that I quoted from a number of scholars. And I would hope that the audience go back and listen to these scholars that say, even some that don't believe in the ascension say that this tradition is passed down and witnessed to by multiple post-New Testament authors that show that this was already firmly entrenched in the early Christian community. So we've got the eyewitnesses early on, 
Then we have the post-apostolic, actually, we have the apostolic community showing this was believed. It was an early feast day celebrated from the very beginning. Indeed, if everything else that Jesus of Nazareth said was true, of course, that wasn't what the debate was about today, then I think he needed to prove this as well, because this is one of the most important uh, events that was prophesied of in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, chapter 7. I've got five seconds. I'll use those to say thank you very much for making this happen, Matt, for giving me the time, being a gracious host, and thank Take you for the, the audience. Take for another it. minute and finish your thoughts. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. So I'll take a minute. I'll take a, a little bit about a minute to say thank you, Matt. I want to thank Matt for being a gracious host, Arden for being incredible, being great there. And the audience as well. I think the questions were very, very, very good. They're very stimulating. It shows me that the audience that tunes in really are listening and really are presenting critical, critical arguments. I appreciate them. I hope they appreciated the case that I laid out. Even if they may not agree with the case that I've laid out, at least to be able to say, okay, well, the early Jews would have expected this. Why should I believe it? And then look at the amounts of witnesses that I've laid out. I think it is the reasonable thing to believe in. Matt, thank you very much for your time and for allowing me to finish my thought there. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, William. Now, as per the rules and the structure of this program, I'm not going to be saying anything specific about this. I'm not going to show up and do a final, oh, no, 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 here's a rebuttal. That's it. Um, this is the first episode of Enboss, and a huge thank you to, to William for agreeing to this. Originally, we were going to have this as a debate on somebody else's channel, and that fell through, um, but I wanted to make sure that we did right by each other. So here's the questions for you guys. First of all, did he convince you? Did he make a compelling case? Did he defeat the Enboss? Well, that's for you to decide. One aspect, one goal of this particular format is something that I legitimately don't think I've expressed to anyone, including Jimmy or Arden. Um, although I don't think it's going to come as a crazy surprise to anybody. And it's something that I need your help with as our audience uh, to find out from you guys if you enjoy A, this format, and if you feel that William and this particular topic together would make for a good full-length format debate where there's more time given and addressed, where there's more of a back and forth, by giving our challengers space to talk, by asking them questions and letting them get the last word on the subject, I'm hoping that this serves as a great barometer for finding the best people to engage with in longer form debates. This gives us an introduction to the person, an introduction to their arguments, and to see if we're actually able to have interactions that aren't likely to devolve into three hours of talking past each other or getting upset or anything other than focusing on an honest assessment and treatment of each of these topics. So give your feedback down below in the comments. And when you're watching the line, uh, the, the various other shows here on the line, uh, which I'll have an announcement about in just a moment as well, um, watch for polls about future debates. Did you see the debate with, you know, did you see in boss when with William on about the uh, bodily ascension of Christ? Did you enjoy it? Would that make for a, good full-length debate. Give that feedback uh, to us to help us build not only better episodes of InBoss, but to eventually transition this into long, full-form debates. Thank you all for the questions and the participation. Any of you who are interested in being a challenger on InBoss can go to qnaline.com and click on the debate application link that's up there. We have a number of applications. You get to talk about what your topic should be and who you'd like to have as the end boss. We go through them, we review, we make sure the people meet the technical expectations. Uh, William didn't take advantage of this, but we should be able for you to um, do screen sharing at some point uh, if you have presentations and slides like that. Uh, stay tuned to the line for more announcements about the next installment of InBoss. We have not set it in stone. This is not a weekly show. This is an intermittent show to help push for more intermittent shows and more inter intermittent debates. 
Thank you so much to Jimmy for the Line Network for the short support and all the production prior to showing up today. And a huge thank you to Arden for producing this, uh, wa wa walking in, just saying, bam, here's how we're doing this. This is what's going on. I've got graphics ready and everything else. Thanks to all of our moderators and screeners. Leave your comments down below. But mostly, thank you to William for making this first inaugural episode of Embossed, one that I thoroughly enjoyed and look forward to more. We'll see you next time. Hey, look, there's all the patrons that make this stuff happen. Jump. All right, so we're going to look at a few of the comments after the debate that were left on the video. Um, first off, hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you enjoyed the debate. You're going to find a, a good amount of atheists that did not like the fact that Dillahunty wasn't able to rebut virtually anything. Now, if people may come back and say, well, did the was that because of the format? Look, there was a cross-examination period. Look, let me be very clear. I didn't have a cross-examination. It was taken from me. The original debate we'd agreed to, which didn't, didn't occur, and I give a tip of the hat, and I appreciate that Matt put this together, but in the original debate format, I had a cross-examination. In this one, I didn't have one. All of the pushback was against me. All of it. All of it. I didn't have a cross-examination. I was put on the hot seat, and it was supposed to be a kind of show that was going to break me down, that I would get defeated by the end boss. Well, you clearly saw that that wasn't the case. Clearly saw that. But people saying, oh, no, who the hell pulled Matt's teeth? William got away with stacks of stuff. Let's be very clear here. Let's be very, very clear here. If Matt Dillahunty would have been able to refute and rebut my Christological arguments, he would have done it. If he would have been able to have done it, if he would have had the theological information, first off, to have done it, he would have. That's very clear. I want to remind the audience that I heavily relied in Christology, Old Testament Christology and New Testament Christology, in my arguments for the reasonable reasonableness of the bodily ascension of Christ. Had there been the ability to say, well, no, very clearly he's not the son of man, that doesn't fit, I can guarantee you Matt Dillahunty would have done it. He tried to offer pushback. But as I said before, I know very well the arguments to defend the longer ending of Mark, the multiple witnesses in the, the scriptures, and the witnesses in sacred tradition as scholars have laid it out. So I find it hilarious that atheists are upset that there is no good refutation to the theistic position. On the other hand, I greatly appreciated comments like this from Trappy Jenkins, who said, I'm not a theist, but William Albrecht is very well read and very articulate. I appreciate that. All glory to God. Not a, not a shred of glory to me. All glory to God. Why do I highlight comments like this? Because if I just was, if I was able to just reach one atheist whose faith is, is either completely non existent, or maybe somebody who's just lost the faith, or maybe somebody on the fence of becoming a believer, if I was able to reach just one person, then it was all worth it. The hours upon hours of study and preparation, all worth it, because all glory goes to God, not, not a shred of it to me. Some people said, well, this guy just ranted. 
the idea was to put me in the hot spot to make me prove my case and then get grilled by super chats, Colin and cross sets. I didn't have any cross sets, not a second of it. I was put right in the hot seat. And I want you to go and judge and tell me, did they break me down? Like I was told was some message of the show. Dillahunty presented himself as the end boss. You arrive here at the end boss and everything is thrown at you, including cross ups from him alone. To which I rebutted everything. To which every single point was rebutted. Christologically, the ascension is reasonable, necessary, biblically. Now, do we have evidence in scripture and sacred tradition? We do. Should we defend this? We should. It is biblical. It is historical. It definitely did occur. William was fantastic. Am I convinced? No. The bottom line is the text and what scholars say about the text is never going to be enough. Can you believe that? If we have historical texts attesting to something that occurred with multiple eyewitnesses, including documents handed down in a succession of line attesting to this being a historical event, nothing is enough. Nothing will ever be enough. Can you believe that? An ancient text will never cut it. Although I brought up multiple ones. I brought up enemies of the faith, St. Paul being an enemy. And if you don't trust those that were eyewitnesses, why not trust an enemy of the faith who saw the bodily risen Christ had no need to abandon their comfortable life of persecuting Christians and living in virtual comfort rather than being on the chopping block, literally. So an atheist can appreciate the presentation, but then they're going to tell you nothing is enough. I appreciate them liking the presentation, but I'm also shocked that there's no amount of evidence that will ever make a difference for them. There's not a shred of it that they care about. At the end of the day, and I'm not saying this it's the case for this individual, at the end of the day, they they simply they simply have rejected the God of Christianity and any kind of semblance of the existence of any God. I appreciated this so much, and I saw so many of these that I appreciated from non-believers. And the only reason I do is not because of, of them praising me. I don't care a lick for any praise. But if any of these people say, okay, I had never heard of that, and they go and they dig and they dig and they dig and they keep studying, maybe one day they're going to come to the faith. Or maybe one day they're going to say, look, there's a lot of compelling evidence for what Jesus of Nazareth said he was going to do that he actually did. There's a lot of compelling evidence for that. I've got to take a deeper look into sacred scripture and sacred tradition. If even just one, at one point we had nearly 2,000 people watching the debate live. If just one from those 2,000 comes to the truth because of that, it was all worth it. I appreciated this. He says, I didn't convince him, but he did learn more because he was an evangelical before. He said, another huge benefit of this format is the educational potential. He appreciated that I could cite my sources, and I urged them all to further study. Cheers to you, my friend, and I hope one day that I can look back, remember you, and you point to me and say, William, I'm a believer now, and I'm worshiping the one true God like you. I worship Jesus, because at the end of the day, if these debates are not being done to help edify you, to bring you closer to Jesus and to bring others that may not have Jesus closer to Jesus, if they're not being done for that, then you're doing it for the wrong reason. The heck with any kind of glory for you. All glory to God, to our triune God. 
If you liked the debate, if you appreciated the debate, please let us know down below. Please consider supporting us as well because we're able to do this research, this study, this kind of work we can do with scholarly research because of our patron supporters. We're able to do this because of you. Your help allows us to do the work we do. Please consider becoming a patron. There is a link down below. Please consider supporting our work. God bless you. God keep you. We will be back. Thank you for tuning in.